Thank you so much for that, and uh, I know it's it's a bit of an inconvenience, but the, if, if nothing else, I can hear you better and, and uh, hopefully respond to any questions or comments that you have uh, uh, better. And I, I know with these kids, sometimes they're down here on the front, and I can't hear them from here to the front pew, and so, uh, or I can't understand what they're saying from here to the front pew anyway. So, we're in the book of first. Yes, I can't hear you, and I ain't doing anything. You can't hear me right now. Okay, we got a lot of uh, uh, reverb in here, and maybe during all of this we can uh, uh, take some of that out. Uh, hopefully they can work on that. But, uh, uh, we, we, just, uh, we just started last week a study of 1 Corinthians, and we did an introduction. I uh, don't want to rehash any of that. We've, we've got a lot to cover tonight uh, on our schedule. My plan is to get through first and uh, second chapter, so we've got a lot to cover. So let's begin in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 1. As we see in the first three verses, this is what we might refer to as the salutation. It's Paul's opening in which he, he identifies who he is and who he's writing to and things like this. And he would say, Paul called by the will of God to be the apostle of Jesus Christ, our, our brother and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all of those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ by their Lord, or both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 1, in the early sections, the first couple of paragraphs, there is a key phrase that is used over and over and over again. In fact, in these first verses here, uh, the first three verses, it's used four times. What phrase is it that you see that's in here four times? It's a name. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus or Christ Jesus. He says it in some form or other here in the first verse, second verse, uh, twice in the third verse. Uh, Paul, we, we obviously know who he is. He is the one that, that uh, uh, was Saul and uh, you know, later was referred to as Paul. He was of uh, the city of Cilicia. Uh, he was traveling on the road to Damascus when God, uh, uh, you know, or when Jesus appeared unto him. And he says here, he is Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle. His apostolic authority does not rest in men, but who? God. That's right. That's what he's saying. He's declaring that he is, in fact, an apostle uh, of God, or by the will of God, not by the will of men. He's been called. Uh, notice uh, the, the term apostle. When we think about apostle, uh, we normally immediately think of the twelve, right? James, James, John, Judas, Philip, Peter, Thomas, Thaddeus, uh, Bartholomew, Andrew, Matthew, and Simon. Those are our twelve. Those are the ones we normally think of. Uh, in that list, though, we don't have Paul's name, do we? Who else is not in that list that we normally think of as apostles? Matthias, right? And so uh, Paul is, we often refer to him as an apostle, uh, late called, and, and certainly we see that here uh, because he is an apostle, uh, but he came later. Acts chapter 9, we see his conversion. He is called specifically uh, for the Gentiles, to, to go to the Gentiles. And he mentions that in, in uh, the, the letter to the Philippians. He mentions it in the letter of Colossians. He mentions it in First and Second Thessalonians. He is called specifically by God to go to the Gentiles. And he's an apostle of Christ Jesus. And he also mentions another one that is with him. And our brother Sosthenes. Now, in Acts chapter 18 and verse 17... When Paul has been uh, set before the tribunal of Gallio, and Gallio listens to the accusations of the Jews and then cuts them off in mid-sentence because they start saying that he has, has gone against our commands and our religion. And Gallio says, don't want to hear it, don't care about it, it's a matter between you and your religion. If this were affecting the community of Corinth, if it was bringing uh, 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 rifts, and, and troubles and trials into the city, then I would, I would deal with it, but because that has nothing to do with civic matters, you deal with it yourself. 
And so he cast them out of the tribunal, and it says, and they, most likely in reference to the Jews had been, who had been accusing Paul, they took hold of Sosthenes, who was the, the keeper of the synagogue, and they beat him. Why, why would they beat Sosthenes, do you think? Okay. Uh, Paul's custom, we know that, was to go into the synagogues and teach as a patron of the synagogue, whether he was the, the one who lined up speakers or he was just the one who unlocked the door. Uh, for whatever reason, Sosthenes allowed Paul to teach. And in teaching, he drew some of the Jews and many of the proselytes away to Jesus Christ. Uh, their jealousy, their hatred, their, their uh, uh, um, passion, the Jews' passion against Paul, uh, they, they wanted to blame somebody. Well, obviously, if, if you've taken someone to court and you've stood before the uh, Gallio, the, the, uh, uh, the, the judge, basically, and the judge says, I don't want to hear this, this is none of my concern, and the next thing you know, uh, the plaintiffs are beaten up on the defendants, then all of a sudden it becomes a civic matter. So don't beat up the defendant who you beat up. Well, the one who's allowed it to happen. Now at that time, in Acts 17, he's simply referred to as, the, as a ruler or keeper of the synagogue. But now Paul, who is writing 1 Corinthians, most likely from the city of Rome... He writes to them and he says who he is. I am Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, called by God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, and my brother, Sosthenes. Basically, one of two things are happening here. Uh, obviously, Sosthenes is with him, probably a traveling. They're the same Sosthenes that was in Corinth before, or this is another man by the name of Sosthenes. Could be one or the other. We don't know. There's not enough evidence given here to say this is definitely the man from Acts 18 and verse 17. But if it is that Sosthenes, think about this. He was a ruler of the synagogue there. Now he's a traveling companion of Paul. What does that suggest about his life in the intervening time? Yeah, that he's become a Christian. And now he's traveling with Paul. And the fact that there's no further description given about who this is indicates that the church of Corinth was at least familiar with this man, which to me suggests that it is the same Sosthenes from Acts 17. He is writing to the church of God, that is, uh, the, the called out ones. It's interesting, when we think of this, the word church, we, we use it all the time, we use it all the time, uh, we hear it in, in Roman society... The, the term ekklesia, as it was used in, in, in the Greek, was used all the time. When a, a, a civic organization of Rome would come together, uh, they would assemble and they, they would call the ekklesia. Or even when the politicians in Corinth or Rome would, would have one of their counselors or one of their gatherings, uh, one of the... the uh, uh, representation meetings as they were a representative uh, a, a republic uh, they would call the meeting to order they would call that assembly and it was an ecclesia and so you know in the original language it is not a word that is um, that really has a theological significance it only became significant after God used to refer to his that are called out, not just called out. It was used. And in those days, when they were called, paramount. The speaker or the orator to use his rhetorical persuasiveness, his eloquent speech, his, his grasp of modern wisdom of that day, to persuade and move a crowd. But in the assembly of God, and notice that's how he describes it here, to the assembly or to the church that is in Corinth, 
to a church that is outside or, or that, that is meeting in this world, but is outside of the world that would would, would take hold of that assembly or that that uh, that persuasive rhetoric and use that. And he says that's not what we use. What is paramount in the church? What is paramount in the church is what the Word of God, Jesus Christ, and Him crucified. That's what is utmost in the church. And that was a great contrast uh, from the society of Corinth to the actual city or the church of Corinth. He is writing to the church of God, to those that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. There again we have the reference to Christ Jesus. Called to be saints. And I like this because Paul says that he is called to be an apostle. And now he says, and you are called to be saints. Two terms that he uses to refer to the church here. And they actually come from the same root. Hagios, or holy. And so you have the first one, sanctified, meaning to be set apart, um, to be dedicated or devoted to God. Second one, called as children, we be dedicated in our lives from the world around us. How are we differentiated from the rest of the world? Okay, by our speech, our actions, it's how we live our lives. I mean, think about it. Uh, uh, we go out in the world and, and, and we work in the same places that non-Christians work, don't we? Not all the same places. Obviously, there's places that people in the world work that we would we would never go near. But uh, we we wear much the same clothes. You know, most of all, most all of our clothes, if not every stitch of clothing in here, was mass produced somewhere. Some of you may be wearing a dress that you you made yourselves, but for the most part, we're wearing manufactured clothes. And the fact that there is one item that looks like this tells you what. There's a bunch more, exactly. There's a lot more where this one came from. And so the idea is, we, we wear the, the same clothes as the world. Uh, you know, we're, we're all cut from the same DNA. We have people of different uh, uh, body shapes and, and hair colors and, and skin colors and, and all, you know, all the spectrum out there. We're all cut from the same DNA as people who are not saved. So what differentiates our life is not clothes we wear or where we work or, or you know, what we look like. It's how we live our lives. You are called to be separate. And so we each have an obligation to examine ourselves. Is my life differentiated from the life of those around me? It's a great question, one that we are called upon to answer. He says that uh, we are called to be saints together with all of those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord. You're, you're not the only ones. Corinth is not the only church. Every church of that age and of every age is called out as well. James? Absolutely. Exactly. And he actually makes that same argument down here in verse 10 and 11. But, but you're right. That becomes our standard. If Christ is our standard, then our lives will be different. If our lives are not different, then what, what can we imply? What do we know? That Christ, that's right, that Christ is not our standard. So he says that he is, that he is, uh, uh, that we are saints together with all who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and our Lord. Why do you suppose he keeps referring back to Jesus? Well, when we think about Corinth, one of the first problems we know about the church in Corinth is what? Huh? Division. So what is he doing? He's laying groundwork. For 13, for chapter, verse 13, he says, is Christ divided? <laughs> no, he's, he's laying groundwork to show from the very beginning of his letter, Jesus Christ is our unifying factor. 
In fact, he even tells us that our fellowship is in Christ Jesus. And we both call him, the, you know, the, the people in other churches, uh, we who are writing to you, you who are listening to the reading of this letter, we all call Christ Lord. There is a unifying factor in Christ Jesus. And that's why he puts so much emphasis on it in these first few paragraphs. Seventeen times in the first chapter, he will use Christ, Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ. Seventeen times. There is an emphasis here, and we need to take notice of it. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There again is Jesus Christ. Uh, he may not in every sentence tell us exactly that we're being unified by Christ, but by repeating that name over and over and over, he is reminding them of where they began. This isn't the first time they've heard Jesus. They all obeyed the gospel because they heard about Jesus. Every one of them has a commonality in their uh, uh, spiritual heritage to Jesus Christ. And he's going back to that point. And he wants them to draw that conclusion with him. Grace and peace. Common salutation in Paul's letters. But, but it really what it, what it does is it's, a, it, it's, a, it, it's an ascent to the comprehensive work of God. He has given you grace so that he may make peace. I know that salutation, shalom, was, was common in the first century among the Jews. Uh, this is the Greek form of that, arene, peace. But Paul means it more than just a greeting of saying hello. Paul is looking at the grace and peace of our Lord. Be to you. He's, he is citing that comprehensive work. And how did it come? It came from Jesus Christ. And then he, he does something that he does common in, in many of his other uh, letters as well. And as we refer to it as the Thanksgiving period. It's the, that moment in the letter when he is writing uh, his thanksgiving for them. And he says, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of our Lord that was given in you, or given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you were not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so he says that I, I give thanks to God. Now, it's interesting, when we go back and we look at uh, the... Thanksgiving period of the, of, of the book of Philippians, for example, or the Thanksgiving period of the one in Colossians, or the one that he writes in First and Second Thessalonians, or the one that he writes to Philemon. It's, it's a very common uh, element of Paul's letters. And it's interesting because he says, I give thanks to you, or get to God for you, because of the grace of God. That was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and knowledge. He recognizes their, their speech or their, the message that they send out, the knowledge that they have of the message of Jesus Christ. But you know something that he says to the Philippians and the Colossians and the Thessalonians? He'll say, and the work which you do and the love that you have. And they're conspicuously, conspicuously absent from this letter to the Corinthians. We think about brotherly love. What does it pop into our mind are the schisms and the division that we see describing the church at Corinth, especially in these early chapters. That type of division is, is not associated with love. Love of the brethren is, is that we, we are unified, that we agree that the church is, is whole and healthy. And Paul, of course, is, is moving the church at Corinth toward that kind of brotherly love, isn't he? And he spends a great deal of time about love in chapter 13. He concludes the letter in chapter 16. Do everything in love. He is, he is getting them to that point because as he writes this letter, there is a definite lack of love in Corinth. That love, that brotherly love that brings the church together so that it may work together as God's organization, as God's institution to save the world. Uh, what we don't see at Corinth is them working together. 
Well, that kind of goes back to the background of Corinth as a city and the issues that they're having is that everyone was out for the status and the power. We're, you know, we're looking out for number one. We're, we're going to, and they eventually divide the church because they're vying for co in competition with one another to have the largest group or the most influence or the greatest impact. And those mentalities are the antithesis of love and work. But Paul does find something to say good about them, to give thanks to God. You know, if you, if you read the, the whole letter one time, and you see all these issues that appears that the church at Corinth has. You might think, well, what could you possibly thank God for this group of people? Right? And Paul says, well, for their speech and their knowledge. Which, by the way, when we get over to chapter 12, when we start looking at the spiritual gifts, the miracles that they had, two in the catalog were speech and knowledge. Where did they get their speech and knowledge? It was the gift of the Holy Spirit. It was from God. Paul focuses all of his thanksgiving about them on not the work which they have done, but rather the work that God has done in their lives. And that, after all, is where the power comes from. That's what he thanks them for here in, in his, his, his prayer. Uh, in every way, you were enriched in him. Notice the, the, the connection of all the, 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 uh, uh, the, the descriptions that he has of them. For example, uh, the given and enriched and confirmed uh, will be sustained and called. Those are, the, those are the verbs, those are the things that he is, he's seeing about them, that, he, that he's seeing God work in them, but notice each one of them. They were given you in Christ Jesus. You were enriched in him. As the testimony of Christ was confirmed among you. And then again, who, uh, uh, the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, at the end of verse 7, rolling into verse 8, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless, in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of who? Jesus Christ. Our spiritual blessings are connected where? In Christ. Isn't that what Paul tells the Ephesians? All spiritual blessings. We've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ in heavenly places. Right? Ephesians 1.3. Jesus is that unifying factor that brought, brings us all together. And he, he ends in verse 9 here, God is faithful. This faithfulness of God, uh, uh, by whom you were called into fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. God is faithful. It, it, it's not their giftedness. That's one of the things they were dividing up over were the gifts that they received. It wasn't their giftedness or their abilities to work that is eventually going to sustain them until the very last day in which salvation will be completed at the judgment throne and they walk into heaven. It's not their giftedness that will get them there. It's what? The faithfulness of God. It's not our prowess that culminates our salvation. It is the faithfulness of of God, and we would say the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He is Lord. And then Paul opens the first section of his letter. And he begins here in verse 10, and he says, I appeal to you, brothers. He uses this phrase again in chapter 4 and verse 16. Uh, chapter 4, the end of the chapter, verse 21, uh, that last paragraph uh, from uh, uh, about verse 14 down to verse 21 of chapter 4 uh, kind of ends this whole section and, and it's interesting he uses the, the, the phrase I appeal to you brothers or I beseech you brothers as some translations have uh, that he is making a tender appeal to them at the beginning of this section and he's making the same appeal at the end I appeal to you and so we say that, that he brackets this section with that statement, I appeal to you. And notice he's not appealing just by the fact that he is an apostle. 
He states that he's an apostle at the very first verse, so we know that he has that authority. And we know that in the book, he's going to address division over his apostolic authority even. But his appeal isn't just based on his ability to come in and thump heads and say, do it this way because I'm an apostle. But based upon what? Brothers. That, that familial relationship that we have. And, and brothers, obviously, is used here of all brethren, brothers and sisters. Uh, you know, it's, it's not exclusive to just the men in the church. It's to everyone. In fact, in Paul's writings, when he refers to the church, he prefers the word brothers. He uses that more than any other collective description of the church. And roughly a third of the times that he employs that word is in 1 Corinthians. Why? Because they're biting and devouring one another. They're breaking down that relationship. And Paul's coming in to remind them, in Christ you're unified as a family. Brothers. And over and over he refers to them and bases his, his arguments upon that relationship. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. There it is again. He is the unifying factor. He is pulling us in. He says that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you. That you might r remove the factions and no divisions. The, the word no division carries the idea uh, that, that they were living in harmony with one another. At the end of his... Uh, uh, letter to the Romans in Romans 15 and verse 5 he says that, that, that we are to live in harmony with one another in Christ Jesus he says here have no divisions in Christ Jesus that you agree that we remove these factions uh, the factious man after the first and second admonition uh, rebuke Titus 3 and verse 10 uh, mark those that uh, are, are causing divisions among you, Romans 16. Division was a, was a threat to the church. In fact, as he gets toward the end of, of verse, verse 11, he says, It has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you. That word quarreling, we found in, in contemporary philosophy text people who were contemporary with Paul, people who predate him. And in any organization, this idea of quarreling was considered a vulnerability for those who are outside to attack it. In, in the Roman culture, in the Roman mindset, if you had a civic organization or a religious organization or a, um, an educational organization, whatever the organization was, if within that organization there was quarreling going on, if it was uh, disharmonious, then that, that opened that organization to outside attack and being destroyed. And Paul uses that word. In fact, he uses the word several times. But here's, here's a people who are, are so well-versed in the Roman culture that it is spilling over into the church that he reminds them, by the way, as you have division and disagreement and quarreling, you are opening yourself up to the vulnerability of the world destroying you. That was reported unto me by Chloe's people, he says. Verse 10, James mentioned a moment ago about uh, what is our standard. He says uh, uh, that there, uh, two things. He says that you be of the same mind and of the same judgment. Uh, the word judgment might... Uh, be translated more as purpose that we'd have the same purpose the same mind uh, indicates what what is our worldview how do we see the world how can we be unified in the same world and it is by having the same standard and that's what James was saying a moment ago that is that standard is Jesus Christ when Jesus is our standard then we are at harmony with all who have Jesus as their standard and if we are at disharmony with those with Jesus as their standard, that is not saying that they have misinterpreted. It means that we have not allowed Jesus to control our lives. And when we say the Jesus standard, that's what we mean. Jesus is in control of our lives. He points the way and we go. 
But there's divisions. What I mean, Paul begins to interpret the report that Chloe's people has given to him. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. And there's a lot of space given in, in commentaries about 1 Corinthians to who is the faction of, of, of Apollos, and who is the faction of, of Paul, and who is of Cephas, and who is of Christ. And what they teach, some have... have given a very elaborate framework. You know, here is Apollos, who was an Alexandrian. He was an eloquent man. Uh, and, and he's in Ephesus, and he's baptizing people who have end up having to be rebaptized by Paul. And look how Paul goes on. He says, I'm not eloquent. I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. He is the opposite of Paul. And so they say, see, the, the faction of Apollos, they're very enamored with eloquence. And they're enamored with, uh, 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 you know, things re revolving around Apollos. And then Paul, you know, they're the ones who follow. I, I don't think Paul so much goes into, or he, he, I mean, he obviously doesn't go into detail. He does, doesn't say, you know, the, those who follow Apollos, you know, here's where they're wrong. And that has led some to believe that Paul's actually just giving a, a, almost a, 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 tra a tragic comedy. That he's, he's almost lampooning their divisions. You know, I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Paul. The ESV translates, I follow Apollos, or I follow Paul. The word follow is not in there. It's actually a statement that a child would make. I'm Kathy's son. I'm Paul's son. I'm Apollos' son. And it's almost like a tit-for-tat playground quarrel. It's not about the doctrine and the theological differences between Paul and Apollos and Peter because what we understand from the rest of the New Testament is that once Apollos learned the way more perfectly, he learned it like Paul. And Peter said there are some things that Paul have written that are hard to understand, but we still believe them. And we agree with those things. They don't have different doctrines and theologies for the church at Corinth to be divided that way. These are more individualistic squabbles. They're just trying to gain one-upsmanship. Yeah? Right. And then we, we give allegiances to those ideas uh, that, uh, well, you know, I don't like that preacher. Uh, I like this preacher. And in reality, both of those preachers have told you the same thing. It's just you like the personality or you like something about this preacher more than you liked it about this preacher. And, and, and so it, we do. Now, we don't necessarily divide up over it. I, you know, we might see some division, I guess, in places, but, but I think for the most part, churches are, are, are pretty, pretty well adaptive to, as a preacher comes or a preacher goes, you know, that, that, that most of the church will continue to be faithful. But, yeah, there are those who are, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, in fact, this, that's, that's why, you know, I kind of lean toward this idea of the tragic comedy. Paul saying, I, I can't believe that you would divide up like this. You know, he is just in, in utter shock that they would take this, this unified body of Christ and divide it up over personalities, like Apollos or Peter, or divide it up over gifts that they had, the gifts of the Spirit, which all, you know, argument in chapter 12 is, you know, they, all those gifts come from one Spirit, and you're dividing these things. And, and you know, he's giving his interpretation. What I mean to say is this, and then he says, is Christ divided? All of this before in chapter 1, Christ in Christ, fellowship in Christ. We co both call him Lord. He, you know, there's a unity that we have in Christ. And now he comes down, and this is kind of that climactic question, when he says, is Christ divided? And it's... It's a rhetorical question, as we normally refer to it, uh, when the answer is obvious. What is the obvious answer? No. 
And he follows it with two more silly questions. Was Paul crucified for you? Was he the sacrifice that allowed your sins to be forgiven? No. Or were you baptized into the name of Paul? One of the commentaries that I've, I've been reading gets to this phrase, were you baptized in the name of Paul? And he even, he draws an emphasis here and he says, in some places, it refers to being baptized upon the name of Jesus, epi. And in other places, it refers to being baptized into Jesus, en. But he said here, it uses the more forceful and more significant Baptized into Ace. What I find interesting on that is in Acts chapter 2, he says we're being baptized into the remission of our sins. Now, he went on to explain later that baptism was not a sacrament that was absolutely essential. And I thought, well, you, you've kind of missed the point. You saw here how important it was. And the emphasis that Paul put upon it, were you baptized into the name of Jesus? And the implication is no, they were baptized into what? Into the name of Christ. But then when it actually came to the application of it, it, it was kind of sad that he missed it. Paul goes on to say in verse 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. Crispus, was, uh, we, we learned, is one of the uh, rulers of the synagogue. We don't know exactly who Gaius is. Some have suggested that he is the tidiest justice, uh, that the proper Roman name you know, had three names, and he would have been Gaius Titus uh, Justice, or Titius Justice, but there's no evidence for that. It was just a suggestion that someone ha had given. But we do know that Titius Justice was converted, and so it's possible that, that uh, this was just another of his names. He says, uh, I, I thank God that I didn't baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized into my name. I did baptize also the house of Stephanus, and he's going to later get into that. It's, I don't think it's a lapse of memory that Paul has got into here, that he just, he's trying to figure out who it is that he baptized. And I don't remember either. Christmas, Gaius, and, oh yeah, uh, Stephanus. Uh, I think it's more Paul is showing that who baptized was not important. That they are non-consequential when it comes to the unity that we have in Christ and the fellowship in Christ Jesus. You know, there are those who, you know, notch their Bible, you know, every time they have a baptism. Paul says, you know, I, I, not only did I, did I bab not baptize hardly anyone there, he said, because Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with eloquent words of, or words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. And so he sets forth here in verse 17 a, you know, the reason, uh, he'll follow up on it in just a moment, but he says, uh, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach. The word send, by the way, <laughs> form of the word apostle. Christ sent me to preach. Is Paul saying that baptism is not necessary or that it's not important? That the most important thing is, is preaching? Not so much. He's just simply saying that it's the, it's the primer. It's the first. Uh, first and foremost, we've got to preach the word. We've got to get the message out so people can hear it. Because faith comes by how? Hearing. If we don't have the hearing, you can't develop faith that will lead you to rep repentance and baptism. So we have to have the baptism. And the idea is that Paul was preaching to these great crowds and people are responding, some of them in droves. As we saw in Acts chapter 2 in the beginning, 3,000 souls added in one day. In order for a contingent like that to be baptized, you have to have assistance. You have to have people there willing to receive them. Crispus and Gaius, uh, Titius Justus, uh, uh, Stephanus, and all of those others. Uh, they're baptizing the people. Paul's not doing all the baptizing. He doesn't have to. He can't. If you just do one person, doing one person at a time, it, it takes too long on these mass droves. 
So he says, I'm, I'm glad I wasn't the one responsible for your baptism. Didn't come down like that. Oh, yeah. This might be a three-quarter class. I don't know. Uh, let me make one observation, then we'll finish. and we'll, we'll pick up in verse 18 next week. Notice that in verse 9, it says, God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship. That becomes the thrust of verse 9, that fellowship. But then he goes into the very next verse and he talks about what? Their division. And he develops this antithesis of fellowship, this idea uh, in, in verses 10 through 17. But in 17, he brings up this idea of Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. The power is in the cross. So what do you think the next section is going to deal with? He's going to further develop that argument in verse 17 about the power of the cross. In fact, Paul's going to go on and he's going to deal with uh, uh, this, this cross, this foolishness of the cross. And he gets down to the end of that and he says, and it, it's about the, the foolishness and the weakness of God. What, what man saw was foolish and what man saw was weak. That's what God chose. And then he's going to pick up that mantle and he's going to spend a paragraph like that. So at the, the conclusion of each of the paragraphs, he really introduces the argument he's going to make in the next paragraph. He does that through chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4. Because all of these chapters deal with divisions and dissensions within the church. Uh, obviously, we'll, we'll have to pick it up a little bit quicker next week, but uh, 18 is a good place for us to stop. We'll pick it up there next week. I, I appreciate your attention and your comments.